Okay, so the goal of this is to, first of all, I'll just give you a brief overview of Perl, and then we're gonna talk through all the different parts that make Perl. It's like five different sort of pieces that come together. We're gonna go through some of the docs that's actually inside the Perl code base, and then start diving into like how some of these pieces come together to create this entire thing. Um, from your perspective, you only ever see it, you, you never needed to go into any of the admin tools or look at the website or any of these other things because I handle all of that. But I want to try and like get a sense and show how all these things come together because it's quite a different setup from Artsy. Um, simply because like I have different constraints to what Artsy has as a personal developer. So 2015, I started Danger. Um, this was started because Apple deprecated the dependency manager that me and Ally had been working on for a few years. So it gave me the free time to start working on the project. Um, by 2016, I had decided that actually <laughs> I was gonna start it all over again and rewrite it in JavaScript because Artsy was moving to React Native and we wanted to have like more fundamental understanding of all the different pieces of JavaScript and how it all came together. So in doing so though, I actually set up a few constraints which was allowing me to start thinking of um, how do I build this into a server instead of previously it was only on CI. So danger attacks this problem of um, as, as teams grow or as they have an as asymmetric number of users in comparison to dev, dev people. Think about in like open source, there's like, you know, I, I can't get GitHub wipes anymore because I merge people's PRs every single day. So, there are so many people trying to send code to you that you actually want to raise the barrier of entry before you actually get to you. And that's what Danger does in open source. Whereas in our, like, uh, in our private culture of Artsy, we use it to be like, oh, we forgot gender entries or uh, like, you know, this analytics thing will need to change this analytics thing. So I like to think of that as like part of our MVP principle, like minimal viable process. And like, and <laughs> this is the words that I used before we had minimal viable process. Um, and so in the work environment is that and in open source is about like growth and trying to automate as much of the like the grunt work that you have to do on a day to day basis. And this this worked pretty well until uh, like I hit this kind of point where I needed something like Parallel, which was we wanted to work on an entire organization scale, not on a single repo scale. So data works on a single repo, Parallel works across an entire org. Um, so roughly one way to think about it is, um, you know, you have a GitHub org and it is attached to a Perl and Perl arbitrarily evaluates uh, danger files for you. Um, and that is how I initially built it. The, every single uh, sort of message from GitHub comes through as a, a webhook that looks a little bit like this and it contains like an action, which is down here and an event. So like the event type is issues and the action is edited. So in this case, you know, it's editing an, an issue and it sends you the full JSON of the issue. And from there you can do stuff with that webhook. Um, what we did, what Peril's like core like central idea is that it makes it very different to a lot of other services is that it thinks that your settings should be separate from the actual application. So if you think of how like uh, a lot of uh, web servers tend to be like, here is your application, you self host it and you can do whatever you want. Um, Peril is kind of the opposite actually. It's like you create this one central server and then all of the unique actual application code for the, for the thing you want to do lives in a completely separate place. And this abstraction allows you to sort of um, not just build like 50 different microservices for every single problem that you need. So if you think about it as like change our checks, most companies would make a changelog check server and then you'd move on to the next one and you'd make a check for spell checking and maybe you merge those two, but maybe there's like assignee checks and then you'd have a server for every single one. Uh, and more importantly, all of that code would end up living in the same server. And Parallel says, no way, actually, all of your unique code should live in your own repo and controlled entirely by you. Parallel's job is specifically to evaluate and run, run it for you. And so that means um, that it comes with a few problems, but it also comes with a really neat abstraction of like, we could support multiple of these setting repos if you, if, depending on the type of problem that you have. So roughly how that ends up happening then is Parallel talks the settings repo back and forwards. Anytime the settings repo change, Parallel says, hey, what's your new settings? Um, and that comes back. And then every time there's a GitHub webhook, it goes straight through Parallel and then it will evaluate arbitrary JavaScript. And that can also go back because that's how it makes a comment. Um, 
the setting of rules, if you've not seen them, looks a little bit like this. So these are the rules for every single, uh, every single repo in an org. So in this case, it's like this pull request, every pull request to artsy will get all prs.ts evaluated. And when it, one is specifically closed, then it will get org slash close prs specifically evaluated. And this is the settings config. This is what the JSON represents. So this is for all repos in an organization. Then underneath that, you can do specific ones for specific parts of your organization. So Reaction and Positron actually have a danger file that is evaluated by Peril, not by danger. So it's not running on CI, it's actually running on Peril, and Peril just pulls out on every pull request this one extra like, file. So if you had a closed pull request on Reaction, it would do this, all PRs, it would then do closed PRs, and it would do danger PR. It would like consolidate them all into like three separate JavaScript files that it would evaluate in a row. And then finally, there is uh, settings, which is just you know generic settings, stuff like you know repos that we don't necessarily treat like the rest of our engineering org. So like analytics and design is a really good example there. Like things that we want that other people other than engineering are using GitHub for that we shouldn't be applying the same sort of rules on. Uh, as well as like some old things that uh, have moved into the like dashboard nowadays. And then finally, there's this idea of tasks. So I'll dive into those a little bit further when we actually talk about like how these pieces come together. So the key abstractions, rules, a webhook comes in from GitHub, it evaluates rules. Then there's tasks, which I guess I'm now forced to do. Um, think about it as like an RFC process, which is you create a new repo that has a, a new issue that says RFC, and then five minutes later, three days later, one week later, we have a Slack message. That's a task, and it's a task that's scheduled for five minutes in the future, three days in the future, and seven days in the future. And then there's schedules. <laughs> it's a little bit compu com confusing, but think about our Monday morning checkup, the thing that looks at like how many open PRs are there, who is assigned to be um, on incidents, and all those things. Those are like scheduled peril jobs that happen once a week at a set time. So that gives you things like every hour you could do something, every day you could do something, a specific day on a week you could do something. So something like uh, a very common problem in open source is that you have like hundreds of open issues and uh, you know, a bunch of them are like five months old and you're never gonna get around to them. So maybe once an hour you check to see if any are like a month old and if they've not had a response, then you just automatically close it. Um, we do like a daily check for licenses to make sure that everybody's got a, a, a license in every open source project that is at Artsy. And they just update an issue for us. So rules, just straight me through webhooks, tasks, arbitrary code that like can be triggered by a rule and schedules, which are uh, something that recurs every single time. So just to make sure I understand, uh, like let's say each PR is supposed to have an SNE. So the rule would be defining it, but then it would yeah. generate a task, like comment. If it you don't could, want. but it doesn't need to, because it uses, it automatically replies at that point. But if you were going to do like, it must have an assignee within three days, then yeah. Because mm -hmm. you could say in three days, schedule a check to look for it. Yeah. That actually would be a good one because like I constantly get this comment. I was like, I just didn't <laughs> remember to put it before I post. I know. <laughs> like five minutes. <laughs> Give us five minutes. It's not unreasonable. <laughs> um, anyway. and that, so that would be feasible. Yeah. So we have some example ones, obviously artsies and dangers is pretty big is, um, and there are, you know, you can go look at how all that works, but that gives you a sense of like what config looks like and what those config repos are and how they come together. So parallel staging is what artsy uses. Um, roughly, this was the original abstraction I said, like you have one organization, it has one parallel and it evaluates many data files. Um, Parallel staging is the idea of having many organizations talk to a single parallel that evaluates many different JavaScript files. And this arbitrary distinction took me over a, like a year and a half to build because it's a really tricky problem. Um, because you're arbitrarily evaluating other people's code. And anybody then could like evaluate JavaScript on your server that could suddenly pull out your environment variables and there you go, suddenly you've uh, got a parallel data leak. And so like trying to figure out the right security abstraction for this has been like, I've gone through it like three or four different times and I think 
think I'm finally at the right abstraction um, <laughs> that scales both with my problem domain is that I don't want, I, I can't afford the same amount of things that Artsy can afford. The only thing I have to do is like cheaper and has to be like simpler and uh, easier to understand because it needs to be documented much better than Artsy stuff does normally because I'm the sole person and I expect external contributors with zero context to go in and make small changes. So a production version of Parallel nowadays looks a little bit like this. Um, webhooks from many different organizations come into Parallel. Parallel then trigger many different lambdas. Um, there is a single AWS lambda per organization. And so that means that like they cannot access each other in any way. So the artsy org only has the artsy lambda and the danger org only has the danger lambda. So what that means is if you don't know much about what lambdas do, they're like, um, they are a function as a service. So instead of building a server and giving, creating a, like a process, so like when you do yarn start and it creates a, like a thing with a port, uh, a Lambda's abstraction is you just provide a function and it's up to the sort of host to handle creating that process for you and putting it on a port. So it's like a separate, it's like a layer up of an abstraction layer from just a process, that, which is normally how we do everything at Artsy. Um, so the idea here is that what you do is you create very, very small services that are only like a fun function big. So you think like a normal API, it's like a lot of different API routes. Every single individual API route would be a unique function in, uh, in sort of the modern vernacular for building service. Um, and so in this case, every single organization is a unique function. There's no extra charge for that. It is. Yeah, there is no charge per function. They are, you, you pay per like microsecond. Yeah, exactly. The time on invocation. So like Peril has a thing that says no lambda is allowed to last longer than 30 seconds. Because you could put a while loop in there and you could do exactly 30 seconds every single time. <laughs> well, true. Um, so roughly what happens is Peril, uh, Peril uses this abstraction that's available in danger, which is um, like, I call it process separation in danger, which is danger in JavaScript will create this like JSON blob and then pass it to a separate process. This is why we can have danger in Swift and danger in Rust and danger in Kotlin. It's also the same abstraction that's used in Peril. So Peril creates this sort of like payload of JSON data that represents your PR, and then it passes that into the function. So like, you, you know, the Lambda function is just a function. I'm just ev evoking it on a separate computer. And this is the thing that goes in. It's like, here is a set of um, paths for you to, uh, to evaluate. So like grab them from GitHub. Then here's the installation. So that's like, you know, the organization. Um, and here's some API access tokens, blah, blah, blah. And here is either the danger DSL or the web hook that came in. And it's then up to the Lambda to sort of figure out what to do with it and evaluate your code. Okay, so this one I think is, <laughs> I originally have slides for this that were really long and so I just put it on them. So danger DSL is the thing here that means that, right, separate danger from peril, just think that you wanted to have this problem of I am doing my CI and I need to validate a PR. So you create a DSL specifically for that. So DSL is like the dynamic small language, domain specific, yeah, exactly. So a, a, the domain specific language for danger is directly tied to a pull request. So all of the information that's available on this page is like the entire API reference for, uh, for, for danger. So it, it has things like fail, markdown, message, parallel, schedule one, and everything inside that is like, you know, I can go into danger.git and that will get me information about the commits and the modified files and like gives you all these extra APIs to do very complicated things. And that is the danger DSL that you get in a pull request event but you can't get that in like an issue or a repo created or anything else because these need a pull request to exist. So you either get the PR, the danger DSL or the exact webhook, and then you can do with whatever you want with either. So, cause you need, you needed to have something that might actually, yeah, so that's actually everything. So that's good, cool. Okay, so step two is to look at this. So that's, and that's an overview of what Parallel is like think of that as like this is our implementation that's what that's that's what we're doing 
but this is how we're doing it. So I have in danger slash peril a um, dot here. I've got what I think I call the service map. Yeah, cool. So I have I, I've been trying to figure out a good way to describe all the different pieces that come together to make this work, and eventually sort of built this kind of parallel service map that tries to describe the sort of five main pieces of like technical architecture that are created to actually provide this experience. So step one is parallel.systems, which is a user facing front end. So that's a Gatsby website that will have like, you know, the sizzle and the cell, a lot like the danger.systems website I showed you there. It tries to describe the DSL, how things work, what a settings config repo is. And there's a dashboard. So, if, you know, like when you go into C Circle CI, you get to see your old builds, you get to make your configuration changes and things like that. That's something that we're also doing. That's a create React app that uses TypeScript and Relay. So it's like, uh, it's not server side rendered or anything fancy, but uh, it's really small and easy to maintain, so it's kind of useful. Um, there's the, the Peril API, which is what I've been calling Peril in this entire discussion. Like, this is completely not user facing. This is the thing that takes webhooks and does the job of saying, like, hey, Lambda Runner, do this thing. Um, now this is actually the first time I've used the word Lambda Runner, but the, there has to be a function inside, there has to be code inside that function, and the name of the code is the Lambda runner. So it is like, uh, it lives inside the Peril API, which makes it a little bit confusing, uh, but uh, it's because they need to share a lot of code. Um, and then finally, there's danger JavaScript, and it's important to, to note that like, the danger JavaScript implementation has specific parts of the code base that are like relevant to Peril. And the way in which Peril is built is to like pull out functions from Danger JavaScript when it needs to in order to sort of make sure that they're consistent across Danger and Peril. Um, so those are the five main services. So I'm going to fly through Peril.Systems and the dashboard because they're like reasonably trivial. Um, everything that we have here is all in staging, in part because the moment it goes to production, then that puts a lot of pressure on me to like fix people's problems and do it right. So while I call it staging, then it's totally fine for it to be buggy or occasionally slow, like the dashboard, because it's got to load up. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that, working on that. Um, so while that's loading, I'll show you how some of these pieces come together. So they're all hosted on now .sh, which is, um, like if Heroku was made a year or two ago, that's what this would be. So it's kind of like, it's not even like JavaScript first, it's any language sort of turned into uh, kind of Lambda functions. So roughly, um, like they're not wrong when they say goodbye to servers in this case, they try and provide these like raw, um, raw APIs that can be used across almost any platform. So like that PHP bit, this go, the React one, and you can use anything. So you can just use Ruby if you wanted to. Um, they try and have this abstraction where like your file systems will represent your API routes. And, um, and it's very clever. Uh, so I've been, been loving it. Uh, but that's what it uses. So if I log into Parallel in here. Okay, cool. Hopefully while it's loading, this may have booted up. All right, white screen. No, don't give me an error. <laughs> staging. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's staging, everybody. Um, so the parallel dashboard, so these are all the um, you, you may be wondering like Ash Furrows in here. I have admin access to a few of a, uh, Ash's repos and he uses page parallel staging. So I get admin access to his dashboard. Um, so it uses GitHub's credential system to verify what things I have access to. Um, so if we take a look at like the artsy one, cause that's probably the most complicated. Um, the dashboard gives you this kind of overview of what uh, parallel 
thinks is your actual settings. So you can see like the one that I showed you earlier is considerably simpler than this version. But this is like, you know, you get a sense now of how it really comes together. Like our Monday informationals task is triggered on Monday morning EST. On Thursday morning, our simple subs is run. You will never have seen these because they're only for uh, GPs. So it, it runs a, a very trivialized version of, of SUP every Thursday morning, um, as well as like, you know, this is how all this stuff comes together and it's kind of nice. So that gives you the overview. You can get a sense of um, how you work with Peril when you're building new things is you can either keep sending the same webhook by like editing a PR or you know, posting a new issue on a, on a, temp a temporary org, or you can tell Peril to record all of the webhooks that come from GitHub for a five minute period. And then you can resend each one individually. So this makes it quite, uh, again, the constraints here are that I don't want to pay for things. So I don't want to be paying to keep a track of every single webhook that GitHub sends to me so that you can then use that for, for development. So instead what it does is it says, you say, I want five minutes worth of recording time and it will record it during that time period and put it in my database. But then, you know, when you hit record again, it wipes them all and then starts again. So conceptually, it, it works around the problem of like storing large amounts of data by saying you can only store data for a certain time period in that time period and it can do some work. Um, so that's pretty useful and you can get the full data. So then hitting resend will trigger the full peril process of like running the rules and then it will comment multiple times if you keep like pressing multiple things. So that's usually how I do my development uh, on a parallel rule, when it, at least when it's very complicated. Most of the time it's in TypeScript, so don't really need to do too much testing because the type system does most of the work for you, but when it's not. There's also the ability to arbitrarily run tasks. So if we were going to validate that the Monday informationals is working, then I could just go in here and just keep sending that. And so it would just keep appearing in our Slack every single time. And again, this is like, it's really useful for running, your, your, for, for testing things out. Uh, I managed to break logs in the switch to the latest, uh, the latest iteration of how do I sandbox Parallels runs. So you used to get the logs sent through into Slack uh, as well as into here. I've got a, uh, okay, I'm gonna keep that hidden. <laughs> Nine messages. Uh, and then finally the settings. So this is like, you can send a, give it a, a URL to send webhook slacks to. So there's a channel called Peril Incoming that tells you when a Peril run has failed or gives you an update when the settings have been changed, um, as well as every single environment variable. So again, this acts a lot like how you think about it in CircleCI. Um, I spent days researching if I can find a way to support environment variables that I, as the owner of Peril, do not have access to. I still have not been able to figure that problem out. If anybody like has an idea for this, that doesn't require like give, making everybody give me maybe a private key. I uh, know the service has to be able to do it. <laughs> I'm still not being able to figure that out. So regardless of my own personal problem of like not wanting to see other people's environment variables, uh, they're there. They have to be there eventually because this is like how we do like the Jira sync, so that the Jira user authentication and stuff like that's in there. Okay, so that's the dashboard. Um, looking at the code, the code is well simple uh, for that. Let's, let's use Peril. So Peril is a mono repo, um, but it's not, it's not a true mono repo in the way that we try and build them properly in Artsy, which is using like mono repo tools. This is a mono repo in like drag and drop all the files into the same place and just see how it goes. Um, both are totally fine, just happens to be one is like proper and the other just kind of works. So uh, all of that dashboard lives inside here. This is structured very similarly to how Artsy's uh, reaction and uh, emission work, except because I'm not using the Artsy API, I, ha I have access to uh, using Relay properly instead of using our crazy fork of Relay, um, which, is, which is nice. <laughs> The, the, so the only major difference there is that I can literally have uh, any version of Relay that I want. Although admittedly, I still use that crazy fork of it because then I could just copy and paste on reaction. Uh, 
But like if you've never set up a relay one, you have to create a schema of GraphQL uh, that defines like what all of the schema is. We're going to go into that when we talk about the API for Peril. Um, but for now, relay talks with this, and then there's just like a normal set of sort of components that like you know here's a relay query renderer. You've probably seen something like this before. But because it's me and I just did it by myself, I'm not. I'm lazy and I'm not separating out the query renderer from the component because it's trying to get things done. As you've noticed, it's not exactly the cleanest of admin panels, but it does work, so that's fine. I can, uh, you know, get it working, make it great. Um, and so all of this actually relies on something called Semantic UI React, which is a really nice library. It's like a modern version of Bootstrap that uh, has a React kind of first style API. So it's, it's, very, it's all very readable. So it's like drop down dot menu, drop down dot header installations, and then you loop through all of the drop downs and there's your menu items. And so I'm very rarely having to think specifically at like CSS and uh, DOM level. So it's a little bit like palette in the sense of like it's a, it's a root abstraction that provides primitives that should cover nearly everything you need for your day to day basis. Um, there's not much clever uh, except the WebSocket stuff. That was very clever, but I broke all the WebSockets when I broke the logs. So hey, uh, <laughs> so that's that's not. We're not even going to show that because it's not even interesting. So that's all of the dashboard. Like realistically, it's just a small relay app that uses uh, React, create React Native. Nothing too fancy. Um, so next up is web. Web is even worse. Like the website for Parallel uh, Staging Parallel Systems is like kind of embarrassingly bad. Um, I'll let that load up. There we go. It is this. <laughs> so that's going nowhere. Uh, I've got a sketch for where I'm sort of trying to go with it. Uh, I'm still haven't quite decided everything yet for it, but I've got, a, I've got some like rough ideas of how I think these pieces could come together, but I don't quite have the full system in my head yet. So I don't want to do it until I do it and uh, I'll get that. But at least, at least the infrastructure to set it up and get it there is working. Um, so that's just a simple Gatsby site. I'm pretty sure it's literally the, uh, oh yeah. There's like a parallel type, there's like a Gatsby TypeScript uh, template and I just whacked that in and changed the word hello world to, from the template so that I could get an understanding of how it all works. This is way too much stuff for me. Like this is definitely like, you know, somebody wants to build like a massive website so they built this massive bootstrap thing. And so my first job will just be like cutting it down to size and making it so that like it just basically just what I want. Um, hello, I'm Beryl. <laughs> right? Okay, so we've gone through dash, we've gone through dashboard and, and web. So knock those out; they're easy. Next one up then is API, and API is Peril, and Peril is uh, is pretty complicated. So roughly speaking, the Peril uh, API is kind of two things, uh, three, <laughs> three-ish things. Um, let's see if I can get a copy of the, the GraphQL. So staging API Peril systems. Okay, cool. See, like even the API has a better homepage than the uh, <laughs> than the website. So, uh, Parallel has three sort of endpoints. There is webhooks have come in endpoints. There is authentication endpoints, and then there is a GraphQL server endpoint. Um, so, if you right. Maybe it's good to look. So this is the version of GraphQL that I use in Peril. I wanted to experiment with something that's not GraphQL, and this, there's only two things that do it. There's GraphQL and this, which is called GraphQL Playground. Uh, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so installation ID, I got no idea. And if everyone's watching, I can't go directly into the database. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go back to the Peril dashboard and pull it out. Uh, staging dashboard Peril. There we go. Okay, so 
you can see here that there's like a GraphQL API for almost all of the things I actually talked about during the dashboard, because the GraphQL powers the dashboard. Um, it provides like, you know, just uh, settings as an arbitrary chunk of JSON to have. There we go. So this lets me look inside um, all the different pieces of the of each sort of installation. So every org that it has access to Peril. So the GraphQL API doesn't do too much. A lot of it is specifically aimed at providing like a better dashboard experience. Um, and so it's only really used to make sure that the dashboard can talk to the API and that the API contains all the sources of truth. And specifically so that the dashboard doesn't actually access the MongoDB that hosts all of these things. So they only talk via an API. Um, so is there anything interesting that it does? Yeah, it's got some interesting mutations. Uh, you have to put that right at the back. So one of the, uh, if you go look at our GraphQL, um, yeah, this is actually kind of interesting. One of the, the domain problems that I have is you can set up Peril and you can add it to your GitHub app. So you can like go and click add Peril. Um, but until you've set up a configuration repo, your Peril, you can't do anything with it because all of the stuff happens in a separate place. So the act of actually creating a, a, um, a, a, an installation, that's what GitHub calls them. So an org in Peril is a process of actually first creating one and then actually setting it up. So the way that I actually make the difference between the two is actually in the type system. So in the GraphQL API, the way that this works is you start up with index. Um, first off, you create a partial installation, and then later you actually create a real installation. So the, the database can actually determine, like, the, the key here is that there's no mutation, like, property with, like, a, like, ready flag that indicates whether your, your thing is done. It's like a complete type change between, like, you have set it up and you have done. Um, so Parallel uses uh, Apollo GraphQL to uh, build its GraphQL API. So instead of how we build it in metaphysics, which is by building all these objects everywhere and they all sort of compose together, we actually just write the raw uh, SDL in GraphQL and then we hook resolvers into it. So like that declares this, the type in that like you know, 20 lines of code, which in metaphysics would probably be like 100, 200 lines of code. Um, and then underneath we have to sort of say like, okay, so you know, when you ask for installations on a user, you run this function. When you ask for installations to set up, you run this function. And the same for like installation, webhooks, partial, blah, blah, blah. And so um, you can see me setting up things like the global ID resolver, which is the stuff for relay, so that you know, caching is guaranteed across the entire system. Um, but it's all just very, very simple functions. So like I have this thing called auth D, which checks your JWT token and fails if it doesn't. So I've got authenticated resolver to guarantee that you have access to the things that you're doing. And so the sort of code that I have here like kind of wraps like authentication and access rights into every single resolver by default, which makes it very easy to just add a new one quite quickly. Um, one of the things that it does, like one of the things that I found very, very quickly was that mutations were like comparatively very long chunks of code in comparison to the rest of my, uh, like my GraphQL instance. So I ended up punting those and putting them into a separate file. And these mutations are like, you know, this is a good one, convert a partial installation to a, uh, to be a full installation. And that will be like, <laughs> you can see right now, there's my authentication on line 47. I'm the only person that's allowed to go and create new installations on this um, because it's on staging. So no one else has like got access rights to do that. Um, that. And that is how I make sure that it's staging, no one else can join. Um, but you can get a sense of like, you know, the process that it's doing. So, you know, we, we, we find the, the thing in the database, we pull it out, we go to AWS and we say, okay, this, this org has now converted and set themselves up for a real config repo. So now's the time to create a Lambda function for them and to hook that back into the database. So this means that like, 
this is where we, where we set that stuff up. Um, and then, you know, editing things, updating, you know, your usual sort of CRUD stuff is all just happening in the mutations too, normal, normal sorts of processes. Um, so one of the things that uh, is, became a little bit tricky once they started moving to the sort of the secure infrastructure of not evaluating code on the same box as the server is that um, things like scheduling tasks or running other uh, bits of code that Peril has access to actually requires making API calls now. So if you were going to do a schedule of tasks and then what that actually does is it triggers a mutation and that mutation then it does the work of, of scheduling the task under the hood and returns something back saying yes. Um, it's actually, it, it, it feels very weird to be saying that like creating, you know, creating a task is a mutation. I'm still not used to the sort of vernacular that like, it's not necessarily a mutation on the graph unless you really think about it hard in a weird way. It's just the sort of strange way in which GraphQL says you can either read something or you can write something. But then like some of the side effecty things you want to do should a class does writes in that case. Odd, but there's no other way that I could do it or I could just create a new API route just for this. Um, in terms of Parallel itself, infrastructure wise, there is, uh, okay, so I had that doc before and does it include, there we go. So the Parallel documentation has specific parts of the Parallel API architecture. So think of it from the perspective of like, from the Parallel API, this is how it works with GitHub. So on launch, it has to check that there's like a connection to a database. Uh, it's kind of elegant actually. See if I've got one that's doing it. Uh, not this one. So staging API and then underscore logs. So this is this is how you get to your logs. You can either do it by a command line, command line, or any now server will include. Uh, this sort of route that will automatically take you to the logs for that exact server. Um, so just while we're here, you can see there's a few things going on. Um, someone's doing something on Artsy Reaction or did something on, on Reaction that has triggered like those success greens at the bottom. And that this job here is detecting that like Merge on Green is, is running. Um, but if we scroll it right to the top, I guess, and I did last deploy last night-ish, so it shouldn't be too far. Well, maybe it is. Yeah, I'll give it two or three more goes. I'm not going to scroll it. Yeah, okay. Mm, fair enough. So it is kind of nice to see it all booting up because it shows you all these different pieces that come together. Yeah, no. When nine in the morning, yeah, it's gonna. That was just two hours worth of logs. That's okay. Turn, turns out Artsy's a pretty busy org. <laughs> um, and so, the where we're, we're in the architecture. So we have all this setup, and then we have to validate that there's like information in the way that we expect it is. And then what happens is we have a an exposed route, like like a REST route for. Um, for GitHub. So it here is called the GitHub runner. So the first thing that happens is a webhook comes in and it gets put into the GitHub webhook runner. I use the word runner everywhere, it seems. Um, and that lives in source API, GitHub, maybe even handler. Oh, there we go, GitHub runner. So this is you know, you know when you've got like 20 lines of documentation that you're in for a fun ride on a, uh, at the, top, the start of a page. Um, this, 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 this kind of like, Par Peril is built entirely in functions because in the creation of danger, I realized how annoying it is to go object oriented in JavaScript. It makes sense when you're doing it with like React components because they don't really interact with each other outside of JSX. But uh, things like this uh, and uh, uh, this is probably the big enough reason for me to just move straight to using functions everywhere. So the, fu the set of functions that make up the, um, the GitHub runner uh, are quite complicated because it has to do quite a lot of stuff. But one of the things that I try to make it do is to make it easy to write tests, I, I separate it all out into lots of kind of smaller configuration objects that go between a lot of different things. So like if you see here, the first thing it actually does 
is just return this kind of configuration object that says, if you get this request, give me back this configuration object that will represent the next step as it goes through the Sunder Parallel Runner. Um, I'm sure it's got a proper name. Yeah, it's called a GitHub Run Setting. And you'll find a few of these like ambiguously named things whose job is only to be a conduit between different parts of the system. So that it's easy to inject tests in between those pieces of the system to make sure that it's easy to, to make sure that it's valid all the way through. So like set up for a request does something and then it's most likely this is the key one, which is GitHub danger room. So like the first thing it's gonna to need to do is be like, okay, so we need to find out is there an action and is there an event? So when we saw like pull request or open or uh, issued or edited, we need to make sure we've got both of those so that when we can start doing some of the sort of funky parsing to figure out what, what runs people might want to do. So we get those, we go and get a copy of the installations config. So if someone, if it's like artsy, if it's like parallel staging where there's many different configuration repos, then we need to get the exact configuration repo for the current webhook. Uh, if it's not, then it actually uh, will just use one in memory. It's kind of a nice abstraction. There's this kind of get DB here. And what it actually is, is a sort of interface to, uh, to something called a, a database adapter. People with like uh, sort of C-sharp skills or Objective-C will recognize the pattern of like only working to an interface and never actually working to the raw implementations. So this has, there's two, two objects that actually work with this kind of database implementation. There's the JSON version, which is just like, you put this file, we just keep it in memory. You only have one of them, so it's not a problem. Versus the Mongo implementation, which is, there's an entirely separate database that contains tons and tons of different organizations and we need to get the right one each time instead of just get generically getting them. Um, I do some like dodgy work with the database at the start in order to make it a synchronous function because we use it everywhere. And so on launch, we make, we make a few validations to make sure that the database does exist otherwise the entire server falls over straight away on purpose. Um, and that, that means that you don't have to make every single function in the entire of this thing an async function, which is a bit of a mental overhead. Um, and so it's, it's, it's nicer to do that too. So next up, we grab some settings. So we need to be able to be like, okay, so here's your config. Uh, you know, is this a repo we should be ignoring, for example? If so, just bail straight away. Um, and then we want to get the set of runs for this event. So uh, the examples, if we have the logs open, it's probably easy to show some. Here's a good one. So somebody has, uh, two hours ago, edited a pull request on danger, and that required running two different danger runs. So think of it as like there are two separate danger, file, danger files that need to be evaluated. That's a pull request? Yeah, so with the danger DSL. So we need to go from, uh, yeah, pull request as an event, an action as a, as a and the action was edited to a set of runs. Uh, so in that case, this code was originally really simple. And then slowly and slowly, I was like, you know what? Maybe we should make this more complicated. And then it got really complicated. And now it's some of the most tested parts of the code base, but it's also like really powerful. So there's trades. Um, because one of the things that I really want to do is make it very easy for Peril to not run on things that you want. Um, a good case of that is like merge on green. See here, we have this, this really crazy looking um, rule. <sighs> crazy looking rule, whatever. We have a crazy looking rule that actually has these parentheses. And so do I have to like make enough stuff move that fully died? Medical disconnect at the end of the meeting. <laughs> it's like yeah, I know. We got 10 more minutes and I barely even touched the code. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll reconnect. Displays. Uh, optimize for. Yeah, it's still not doing anything. Yeah, I did that ages ago. Cool. I'll reconnect. There it is. Just Yeah, while you see that, while I get back into this, see how it's uh, it's got this sort of wrapper at the end? So first of all, that will only run if, uh, if it's a tag. So it will be an event called create, and it will look inside the JSON and see if it's creating a tag, which is different from if it was a push. So like if, if that, that create happens every time a new branch is created. So it, it would, 
in order to make sure that Parallel only runs in the right context, then you can say only run when it's a branch, uh, branch for example, or only run when it's a tag, for example. And so what it does is it dives into the, the JavaScript, the JSON the webhook that, that they give you and lets you run arbitrary like evaluation. Um, because if you're paying per second by Parallel, then like running on every branch doesn't make sense because you don't want to do that. And, give, and the important one for me was like merge on green. Merge on green, we don't want to check to see if we should merge on a green and if it's not green. So it checks if it's green. Um, okay, cool. So that does all this stuff, pulls all these runs together, um, eventually sort of gets to a point where it's like, okay, I think I've got enough stuff to do something with here. And that means there's going to be one of two types of things that could come out of this. There could be a PR run or an event run. A PR run is the one that I described earlier that does the, de the, the danger DSL, so the thing with like git.modified. Um, an event run is one that just jams in the webhook JSON. So if I show you a case in here, um, so we can use that, it's easier. If you look at that pull request, not a great case. Let's do Marcus Major Green. Great. This one's really simple, so that makes life easy. You can see here that how this is structured is there is an exported function that is asynchronous that contains a, a single parameter. And this is pulled out by danger. If you look at the bottom here, we should see that that is the default export. of. Uh, so what danger does is it evaluates your source code uh, and then it looks to see if there's a default export. And if there's a default export that is a function, then it will call it. And what this does is it allows you to use async straight away. So you can't use the word await in a function. And if you've never used await, roughly it's like, you know, wait until, you know, promise dot then, but actually on the same line instead of uh, like going and indenting down a lot. So this makes it really easy when you're working with uh, something like this, where it's like you get the repo and then you check to see if uh, you, you run some arbitrary asynchronous code and then it comes back and it doesn't require indenting a lot. Uh, you probably touch fetch or something like that that might use it. But if you've not, then this is like a language feature that makes it very easy to do asynchronous work. But roughly, you can see here that it passes it in. I ended up building a, a library called GitHub webhook event types, which uh, automatically generates all of these sort of very large webhook interfaces in TypeScript so that you get the TypeScript support in danger of the event that you've registered to. Uh, it's a separate library, but like the two are effectively essentially combined. But you can see here that this one is hooked up to either an issue comment or a pull request review. So if it's a pull request review, then you can say merge on green. I forgot that that was actually a feature that someone added because I didn't remember that you could do that. But <laughs> you can see here that someone's done it because the type system says so, <laughs> and, uh, and there'll be tests. So it's either a PR DSL where you get it just available through the import of danger at the top, or it comes in through the default export in a file as the webhook JSON that you had originally. And so it, it now starts looking through this, uh, this, it, this issue JSON is like, ah, does the text, it pulls out the comment body and says that's the text. And then further down the line, it's like, ah, do you have merge on green or merge on CI green inside the text that, you, that, that is unique to that JSON payload? And so if you do, then check to see if the labels already include much and green. If they don't, check to see if they have org access. And if they do, then uh, create or update, uh, create or add uh, the label um, and green. That's how Mojo Green works on every single repo. Uh, so takes arbitrary webhook because it's an event, what do they call it, an event run? PR run, event run, yeah. And then if you're running on the same server, it's feasible that you could actually comment back from Peril, but that's not used enough in production for us. Um, the other thing that was like really tricky, which uh, is a little bit less interesting, but is kind of interesting from my perspective, was authentication. Um, I wrote an entire blog post on the Artsy blog post about this. It's like, how does Peril use JWTs in a way that uh, is, is kind of expanding on how Artsy does? 
So there's two types of JWTs in Peril. There's a Peril, yeah, a Peril, the Peril uses a JWT, which lasts 10 seconds. So this is a lot like the app token that we create uh, before some certain requests. You know, we, we see some metaphysics in the link. Um, the this thing. Uh, it's like the idea of a temporary token that gives you access rights to one specific server is exactly what I built, uh, but it's one specific org instead. So if we did a consignment convection link. So this, this thing here, this token loader is what we, what we call it, but effectively it says, ask gravity for the access rights to temporarily make API calls to convection. And then metaphysics will now use that for the next API call. Um, and I think Mick wrote a blog post talking a little bit about how this app uh, authentication token works. So I use this one for short term, every single peril run gets a, an authenticated token for that. Um, 10 seconds doesn't make sense. It should be 30 seconds, but better make those API calls early. Um, but, uh, but there's also another one that, uh, I can't remember where that comes from. Oh no, oh, no that's now. Okay, cool. I'm going to leave that there. I'm probably sure that I knew what I was doing, but the, <laughs> the other one it uses is for all user database. So there is no users database in Parallel. Like there is no sessions database in Parallel. There's only long lived JWT tokens, JWTs. Um, and what they do instead is they say like, you go to GitHub um, and generate JWT from request. Is this the one? He calls out a JWT, it can be explicit by the puckies. No, this is, this is pulling it out, not creating one. Um, there we go, this is the one. So generating a, a token is the equivalent of creating a user account in Parallel. There's no sessions, there's no user accounts. So what it does is uh, it, you make this request and it, it says, go to GitHub, get the list of every single installation that, uh, of Parallel that I have access to. So that's why I could see Ash Furrows. And then it bakes all of those into a single JWT. So you have this access token that is signed by Perl and it's trusted and therefore like I can test it that it's been signed correctly next time that contains a list of your username, your avatar URL, and a list of every installation that you have access to. So the next time you make an API call, I don't need to do a user table lookup or a session table lookup. I verify that that token has been signed correctly if it has been signed correctly, then I can verify the data inside it. If I can, then the data inside it represents your username, your picture, and everything that you have access to. And so instead of putting that in a database, I chunk it and put it on a computer. Big downside to this is like, what if your user installations change and stuff like that? Haven't figured that out yet. Probably just gonna have like a refresh my JWT token or something like that. Like I'm pretty sure it's what Circle and Travis do. So, um, it gives me the freedom to not have this massive database that could, uh, I don't want, uh, as well as the ability to say like, it's all stored on your computer and you just log in again if you want to have a second session. Um, so that's a pretty good one. There's a blog post on that. Uh, I think that's it. That's generally the overview of as many different pieces of parallel that I can get that comes together. A lot of the documentation lives inside the main repo. Um, there's a docs folder, like there are, quite a lot of other teams now that use Peril internally. Um, and so it's well documented for external folks, which was like a, a constant aim for me. Um, but if you're trying to understand like artsy setup, then this, this Peril staging document is actually the one that describes our exact system. So you get a sense here of like the web hooks come in, it talks to the MongoDB, there's a GraphQL API, it talks to all these different runners, they do the actual work, as well as the links to like all the different pieces that actually come together to actually create the staging parallel instance. Oof. No time for questions. <laughs>